In video 84 of Tensor Calculus, we'll pick up where we left off from the last video and use our understanding of Riemann normal coordinates to explore the various symmetries and identities of the Riemann tensor. We ended the last video with this expression for the Riemann tensor using Riemann normal coordinates. Now this form proves to be very useful for evaluating the various symmetries and identities of the Riemann tensor. So let's jump right in. The first thing we'll do is to re-express the Riemann tensor after switching the first two indexes. We're going to swap lambda and omega. Now observe that this term is the negative of this term. They're the same term with the opposite sign. Now, of course, you remember that the order of these indexes doesn't matter. The, the uh, covariant metric tensor is symmetric, so we can swap these, uh, the order of these indexes anytime we want to. So these two are the negative of each other. This is the negative of this for the same reason. And this one is the negative of this one. And this one is the negative of this guy right up here. So what we see is that every one of these terms right here has a negative counterpart in this expression up here. And that means that these two expressions right here are the negative of each other. In other words, the Riemann tensor is anti-symmetric with respect to the first two indexes. Now, don't let me lose you here. Uh, we saw that this relationship is true for Riemann normal coordinates, but how do we know it's true for uh, all cases in general? Well, that's because we fall back on the nature of a tensor relationship. Remember how this works. We have here a tensor relationship. This is a tensor. This is a tensor. So to prove that this relationship is valid for all coordinate systems, all we've got to do is to show that it works for any one individual coordinate system. If it works for one, it'll work for all because this is a tensor relationship. Well, we know that it works for Riemann normal coordinates, so this proves that it works for all cases in general. All right, let's move on to the next one, and this time we'll swap indexes alpha and beta. Now notice that this term is the negative of this term. This one is the negative of this term. This is the negative of this one. And this is the negative of this. So again, we have the situation where every one of the terms in this expression has a negative counterpart up here. And that means that our Riemann tensor is also anti-symmetric with respect to the third and fourth indexes. Okay, this is fun. Let's keep going and do one more. This time, what we're going to do is to swap both of these indexes for both of these. We're going to swap these, the first two, to the third and fourth position, and three and four to the first position. This time, we see that this term equals this term, same sign. Remember, the order of differentiation here does not matter, so these two terms are exactly equal. Now, likewise, this term right here is equal to this one. Again, the order of differentiation doesn't matter, nor does the order of the indexes on our metric tensor. All right, and they have the same sign here, too. Notice this one is the same as this one. Again, we don't care about the order of the indexes in the metric tensor or the order of the differentiation. And finally, this one equals this one. The order of differentiation doesn't matter. So in this case, every one of the terms in this expression has an equal counterpart up here. And that means that our Riemann tensor is symmetric with respect to this flipping of the pairs of indexes. Now, initially, the Riemann tensor looks like it's very complex and complicated. After all, it's a fourth-rank tensor, so it's going to have a lot of components. 
But these various uh, symmetric relationships cut down greatly on the complexity. For example, if we were dealing in two dimensions, they're going to be uh, 2 to the fourth power, or 16 different components to this uh, tensor. But because of the symmetric relationships here, 12 of those 16 components are going to be 0 because of the anti-symmetric relationship. And for the other 4, it turns out that there's only going to be one degree of freedom. The only real degree of freedom is R1212. The other three non-zero components will be some uh, permutation of these, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 1, 1, 2, or 2, 1, 2, 1. So there are only four ways to permute these two indexes in such a way that they're non-zero. So what looks like a complicated uh, tensor over here is actually, in the case of two dimensions, limited to only one degree of freedom and only four non-zero components. Well, if we're dealing with three dimensions, we'd have 81 components. 45 of those would be zero, and uh, that would be 36 non-zero elements, but they would be limited to six degrees of freedom. And then if we had uh, four dimensions, we'd have 256 components, 112 of them would be zero, and the other 144 components would be limited to 21 degrees of freedom. So these symmetric relationships cut down greatly on the number of components that we have to evaluate. Okay, let's move on now and explore a couple of identities that are related to the Riemann tensor. This time I'm going to permute the last three indices. I'm going to rename omega to alpha. I'm going to rename alpha to beta. And I'm going to rename beta to omega. Next, we'll do the same thing again. I'm going to rename alpha to beta, beta to omega, and omega to alpha. Next, we'll add these three equations together. So we'll add everything on the left side, then everything on the right. So we'll take this one, add this one, and add this one. On the right-hand side, we've got to add all these together. It looks like we could wind up with 12 terms, but there are some things that cancel out. For example, this one will cancel out this. They're the same, but opposite in sign. Remember, the order of differentiation doesn't matter. Okay, well, how about this one and this one? They're opposites. Uh, again, the order here of the indexes on the metric tensor doesn't matter, so these are the same. How about this guy right here? Well, this turns out to be the uh, counterpart of this one. They'll add together to zero. The order of differentiation doesn't matter. Okay, how about um, this one right here with this? They cancel out. We can switch the order of the indexes up here. And then how about um, this one with this? Here we change the order of differentiation and their opposites. They cancel out. And lo and behold, this one cancels out this. So what that tells us is everything cancels out and the right-hand side is simply equal to zero. This result is a very interesting and important relationship known as the first Bianchi identity. All right, there's one more I want to do. This time what I want to do is to start by taking the covariant derivative of our Riemann tensor. So we'll find the covariant derivative with respect to sigma of our lambda, omega, alpha, beta. Okay, well to do that, of course, we always start by taking the partial derivative with respect to this index right here. And that's just going to produce the third order partial derivatives of each of these terms as we go through them.
Next, we need to uh, add uh, four more terms, all negative terms, using the Christoffel symbol, one for each of these indexes down here. But hang on a minute. We're working in uh, Riemann normal coordinates. And remember, in Riemann normal coordinates, the Christoffel symbols are always equal to zero. Therefore, all of the terms that we would normally add here disappear because the Christoffel symbols are equal to zero. So what you're seeing here is yet another advantage for using Riemann normal coordinates. The covariate derivative is equal to the partial derivative. Of course, you know that's a property of uh, Cartesian coordinates. The uh, covariate derivative is equal to the partial derivative in Cartesian coordinates. Well, Riemann normal coordinates act just like Cartesian coordinates at the point of evaluation. So in Riemann normal coordinates, this is the covariate derivative of our Riemann tensor. OK, well, now what I want to do is to permute the indexes similar to what we did just a minute ago. I'm going to rename sigma to lambda. I'm going to rename lambda to omega. And I'm going to rename omega to sigma. All right, we'll do it one more time. We're going to rename lambda to omega, omega to sigma, and sigma to lambda. OK, so uh, next we want to do what we did before. We're going to add all three of these equations together. We'll take this one, we'll add this one, we'll add this one, and we'll do the same on both sides. But before we do that, let's pause here a minute and just reflect on uh, this thought. Um, suppose we weren't working with Riemann normal coordinates here. Well, if you remember, the full definition of this involved two additional terms out here with pairs of Christoffel symbols. Well, if we're going to take the covariate derivative of that, we'd have to take the partial derivative of everything. Well, that would result in a partial of this plus the product rule here twice. So that would result in five terms. And then we'd have to add another four terms with the Christoffel symbol times each of those five, uh, well, each of these three terms. So that adds another, what, 12 terms or so. So each one of these would have 18 terms on the right-hand side or altogether, there'd be 54 terms over here to deal with. So I, I hope you see how much easier it is with Riemann normal coordinates. If we did it without that, it would be a bloody nightmare. We wouldn't have enough room on this screen or several others to do what we're about to do. OK, well, let me move up a little for a little space, and then we'll uh, add all these together. So now we have to add all these things together, combine them. And based on what we did a few minutes ago, you can probably tell where this is headed. Uh, look at this term and this term. Remember, the order of the indexes doesn't matter, and the order of the differentiation doesn't matter. So these two are equal and opposite, so they cancel out. So how about um, what's next? This guy right here and this one have the same indexes here, the same indexes there, opposite sign. How about this one combined with, um, which one's it going to be? It's going to be this guy down here. Same upper indexes, same lower indexes. And this one will cancel out with this one. And this one is going to cancel out with this one. And finally, this one cancels that. So just like before, all of the terms on the right-hand side cancel out, and that leaves us with a big fat zero on this side. This result is somewhat similar to the one we did just a few minutes ago. So it shouldn't be any surprise that this one is known as the second Bianchi identity. OK, and um, with that, we'll uh, bring the video to a close and do a recap of what we've done.
What we've done in this video is to make use of this expression, which is the formula we derived in the last video for the Riemann tensor in Riemann normal coordinates. Now you'll remember that the full expression for the Riemann tensor involves these two terms plus uh, some others that involve the Christoffel symbol. But in Riemann normal coordinates, the Christoffel symbol evaluates to zero, so all the other terms drop out. This greatly simplifies our analysis. Because of the nature of tensor transformations, any tensor relationships we discover in this form have to be true in all cases. We first use this technique to investigate a number of symmetries of the Riemann tensor. We discovered, for example, that the Riemann tensor is anti-symmetric with respect to the first two indexes. If we swap index 1 and 2 here, we will introduce a negative sign. Likewise, it is anti-symmetric with respect to indexes 3 and 4. If we swap these two, we'll introduce a negative sign. But if we swap the first and second with the third and fourth as pairs, we swap them like this, we find that the relationship is a symmetric relationship. We can swap these two pairs without changing the value of the Riemann tensor. These symmetries greatly reduce the complexity of evaluating the Riemann Christoffel tensor. Although there are n to the fourth components in the Riemann Christoffel tensor, most of them are zero, and those that are not are limited by the number of degrees of freedom. For example, in two dimensions, of the 16 components of the Riemann tensor, 12 of them are zero, and the other four are limited to a single degree of freedom. We then went on to use this technique to derive a couple of identities known as the Bianchi identities. The first Bianchi identity is this one, in which we add the Riemann tensor together in three forms, simply permuting the last three indexes. We just rotate these three indexes around cyclically, and when we add these three forms together, we'll get a value of zero. Now, the effect of this relationship is that it adds one additional limitation on the degrees of freedom. For example, these symmetries will limit the number of degrees of freedom in four dimensions to 21 degrees of freedom. But this limits one more degree of freedom because when we know the first and second, then that determines the third. So when we combine this first Bianchi identity with these symmetry relationships, a four-dimensional space would be limited to 20 degrees of freedom. Well, the second Bianchi identity is similar to the first, except we rotate these three indexes. We permute these guys. We simply rotate them cyclically. And if we add them together, we get zero. And of course, the difference is that this involves the um, covariant derivative. Now, in some literature, you'll see it expressed this way. This index is permuted with the last two in each case. But because of the symmetry that you know about, then you see that this is just the equivalent because we can swap the first and second with the third and fourth. So these are two different ways of expressing the second Bianchi identity. Well, these are two very important relationships that we can make use of in future videos.